Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar entitled Resources for Higher Education Institutions Recruiting in South and Central Asia. My name is Caroline Smith, and I'm a program officer in the Education USA branch covering the South and Central Asia region. I'm joined today by two Education USA colleagues, um, Karen Bauer and Ishrat Jahan. You can see their beautiful faces there on the screen. And I will um, introduce them and actually turn the presentation over to them in a moment. Um, but just a short intro about Education USA. And before I jump into that, just a quick housekeeping item. If at any point during uh, today's webinar you have a question, please feel free to type it into the chat box and we'll get to all the questions at the end during a formal Q&A session. And when you do type your question in, just make sure to state your name and institution that you're from. That will help us out. All right, so let's get started. Some of you might be quite familiar with Education USA and have already utilized uh, our resources available to the US higher education community. And for others, you might be tuning in to learn more about what Education USA has to offer, especially when it comes to student recruitment in the South and Central Asia region. So wherever you fall along the spectrum, we thank you for your interest in Education USA and tuning into today's webinar. And today we're really gonna focus on recruiting international students from South and Central Asia. We'll cover everything from a regional overview to student mobility trends, to recruiting tips and more. And this webinar is part of a yearly webinar series directed at US higher education institutions in an effort to provide and discuss best practices and useful tips for recruiting international students to add to your institution's internationalization efforts. And with that, all right, there we go. I just want to start off by giving you a quick overview of Education USA. And for some who are very familiar with Ed, Ed USA, this, this is just an overview. Um, you're probably familiar already. So plain and simple, Education USA is the State Department's worldwide network of educational advising centers, staff, and services. And we promote US higher education to audiences abroad. And worldwide, we have over 400 Ed USA centers in around um, 170 countries and approximately 550 plus Education USA advisors. And this slide has pin drops where all our centers are located, just to give you a visual of how expansive the Education USA network really is. And within all those countries, EdUSA advising centers are located in a variety of different spaces or setups. Um, they can be located in US embassies and consulates in Fulbright commissions um, or by national centers, local NGOs, or even local universities. It just depends on the country. Um, this slide shows you a breakdown by, of locations by region. And just to note, 34.7% of our centers are located in US embassies or consulates worldwide. So that sheer location of Education USA centers in the embassies and consulates um, naturally um, promotes that collaboration between US public diplomacy efforts and Education USA in the region. And here's a snapshot of what we do. So our centers offer accurate, comprehensive, and current information about opportunities to study at um, accredited post-secondary institutions in the U.S. And so with over 4,700 accredited U.S. institutions, you know that um, for a prospective international student considering study in the U.S., that can be really overwhelming. And you know, how do they navigate this vast amount of options available to them? And that's what our um, Education USA advisors help them. They help them navigate and find the best fit for them. Um, and they really do empower them with the tools to, to find the best fit. And it's important to point out that Education USA promotes all accredited US higher education institutions equally. 
We also support the U.S. higher ed community through helping institutions like you all with international student recruitment and retention. And just that third point, we also engage with uh, foreign institutions and governments regarding student mobility to the U.S. Um, so a lot happening with Education USA and a lot of different audiences we're reaching out to for sure. There we go. And supporting and helping um, us to oversee our Education USA uh, network of advising centers worldwide, we have our wonderful Education USA regional educational advising coordinators, and that is a mouthful to say. So we oftentimes refer to um, our regional educational advising coordinators as REACT for short. And our REACTs are based in 14 locations. And this slide shows where the REACTs are located. And joining us today, we have two REACTs for South and Central Asia, um, who I will turn the presentation over to in a moment. Education USA REACTs manage multi-country portfolios and provide direction, subject matter expertise, um, training to the Education USA advisors in the field. REACT also provides strategic guidance to U.S. colleges and university representatives on ways to reach diverse and student audiences um, and ensure international student success on American campuses. So uh, REACTs are a wonderful resource. Okay, so that concludes a very, very brief overview of the Education USA network. Um, and now we're going to focus on the South and Central Asia region for the remainder of the webinar. And hopefully, many of your regional and recruiting related questions will be answered. All right, so this slide just gives a snapshot of what Education USA looks like in this region. Um, as you can see, there's 13 countries in the South and Central Asia region. And total, we have 31 centers throughout those countries um, with 75 plus advisors. And India is the country with the most advisors and number of centers. A lot of prospective students to reach in India, so um, maybe that's why we have such a presence there. And within this region, um, you can see that centers are hosted in U.S. embassies and consulates, local NGOs, Fulbright commissions, and American councils. American councils, that's specific to Central Asia. And last but not least, I want to invite um, my colleagues, our REACTs, to join us at this point because I'm going to get ready to turn the presentation over to them. Um, we are joined by Ishrat Jahan and Karen Bauer. They're both REACTs in this region. Um, Ishrat is based in New Delhi, India, and Karen in Dubai, UAE. And you can see on the slide that the countries that are encompassed in their portfolio. Um, and they really do have incredible expertise uh, in student mobility trends, challenges, opportunities, and more um, in the South and Central Asia region. So at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to them to take it away. Thank you. Well, hello everyone, and thank you so much for coming to our webinar. We're gonna start out with regional overview and trends in SCA. And what better way to start off with our Open Doors numbers? As you know, IIE and the State Department put out the Open Doors report that comes out during International Education Week, and we all saw um, the release of those numbers uh, last month. We're very happy to report that we have um, 238,621 students from our region studying in the United States. And as you can see from the blue line, the graph, um, the numbers are going up and have been going up for a number of years, um, with this year being a 3% increase. So we're really happy that the numbers are continuing to grow. Um, as with many places around the world, many of our 14 countries um, are in search of effective growth strategies. Um, we're looking at geopolitical events that have reshaped education and access in many of our regions. Governments and ministries are on the quest for growth and strategy. 
Um, many of our students are wanting to study in the United States. Some of them don't have government scholarship programs, so they're looking to increase their English language. There's all these different variables that are really impacting the growth um, that we definitely want to continue to see. Um, if you look at the U.S. study abroad students coming to the region, um, we have a pretty robust number at almost 5,000. There has been um, a decrease in 13.4%. But as you can see with the graph, um, that number tends to fluctuate over the past 10 years. Um, and although we don't have as many students in places like Europe and South America, we definitely want to see that number grow. Um, and we will talk a little bit more later in the presentation about the numbers directly for study abroad and how we might um, tell you about what's happening in certain countries and how you also might be able to help us help more students come to our region. All right, so um, this is just a further breakdown of uh, the open doors numbers um, from last year to this year. You'll see uh, that Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, and Bangladesh have the highest growth in the region for the last um, report of the year. You can also notice that if you look at the far right column, you'll see the percentage in change. Um, so you'll see that really most of our countries, the numbers are up. Where the numbers are down um, are in smaller countries or countries where there's, you know, political or different variables that are at play for those numbers pushing down. So um, this is just a focus on Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, and back in Bangladesh, and just showing that those are really where we're seeing the growth and where Education USA is doing a lot of work on the ground to reach students. So we'll give you a little bit more about those examples um, further on. Hi, everyone. This is Ashok Jahan. Um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you for joining us for this webinar. And thank you for listening to the recording if you are doing so now. I'll talk a little bit about what this slide represents. We wanted to really share with you uh, what mobility looks like overall, not just to the United States, which is the middle column, but also abroad, just generally abroad. As you can see, the region is highly mobile. Um, while the numbers to the U.S. are smaller numbers, there's significantly higher numbers that are actually studying abroad from each country, according to the UNESCO numbers and data. These are countries that um, most of the countries in the, in the region are remittance-driven um, economies. They receive money from abroad, from labor industry and folks that uh, their family members that might be working in different parts of the world. It's cash economy, so they have sometimes trouble getting money out of the country. So they're looking for countries where they can have more ease. It's a youth bulge. South and Central Asia is a major youth bulge in the region. Um, but it's also a matter of them not being able to find enough institutions and enough seats within the institutions in their home countries. So the home countries in the entire region just doesn't have the capacity to host the number of youth coming up, coming up to higher education level. Um, in addition to that, it's not about students learning whether they should go to the United States or not. Our Education USA advisors, it's mostly about explaining to them how to go to the United States. Again, they're very familiar with going to going to the UK, applying to Australia, because it's familiar, it's close to home. Um, some A lot of things are similar as far as governmental infrastructure and the way that institutions are set up. So US is very, very foreign for most of the region. So they need a lot of education and information um, on how to approach studying um, into the United States. Um, you know, it's a, it's a growing number of public and private institutions also in the region to meet the demand of the youth bulge. But again, they just don't have the capacity and there's limited seats. So you're going to continue to see very qualified students coming from the region. And ones that apply to the United States and, to, and tend to be the highest ranking students in their classes. Just a little bit of a breakdown why what it looks like for academic level in the region. Um, just India, Nepal, Bangladesh, Pakistan continue to be among the top 25 countries of origin of students studying from South and Central Asia in the United States. Um, it's interesting that this uh, open doors, we saw a major flip for the region. As you can see, undergraduate numbers are up. It's a 3.8 increase, whereas graduate numbers are a little bit decreasing. Um, and that's because of the Indian numbers. Indian numbers are significantly 
uh, are significant for the region. So there is a little bit of a decline in the India graduate student mobility. What was interesting is we did see a non-degree um, also have an increase and I've seen across um, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, an increased number of M1 visas being issued. So these are going for vocational studies, flight schools, um, with the relationships between US and the countries there, or even associate degrees, and some might be transferring their statuses. Um, and OPT, of course, is all those graduate students already in the United States that are accessing OPT. So predominantly a graduate market for South and Central Asia, but we're slowly starting to see a growing undergraduate market. So I wouldn't knock out and just call South and Central Asia a graduate market anymore. It is a, definitely, we're seeing more interest in among the undergraduate students. And I'll turn it over to Karen to give us a breakdown for the undergraduate trends. Great. So as you can see, as Ishak mentioned, we've seen an increase in undergraduate trends, particularly for my countries, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, and Turkmenistan. Um, particularly Kyrgyzstan. Um, the similarity in all these countries is that we have a very robust cohort advising group and our advisors have really worked over the past few years to work with high school students and undergraduate students to help bring them up. As you can see, these are quite small numbers, um, very different than a place like India, but still those numbers and that increase really has a great impact um, within the country. And so by using our cohorted boards advising groups, we've really seen that we can get more students at the undergraduate level to come to the United States. Um, so that's particularly why we've seen that great jump, um, particularly in those three countries. And I'll add that throughout the region, of course, South Asia, India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, Education USA and the US embassies have met concerted efforts to really engage um, influencers for the undergraduate market. So we're training high school counselors and starting up programs, building networks with guidance counselors and high school counselors and private players so that they receive accurate information to pass on to their students. And then on the graduate level, we're also seeing um, increase in Kyrgyzstan, Turkmenistan, Bangladesh, and Kazakhstan, um, particularly for my countries in Pakistan um, and Kazakhstan, there are very robust government scholarship programs. Um, so some of you might have heard of the Bullishak International Pro Scholarship Program that was established back in the 1990s. Um, it used to be an undergraduate program and it switched a few years ago to a graduate program. So they're really pushing more students in uh, Kazakhstan to continue their studies at the graduate level. When it comes to Pakistan, um, we started a new U.S.-Pakistan Knowledge Corridor PhD program um, with the aim to spend, send over 10,000 doctoral students to the United States over a five-year period. We've been working very closely with ATC, the Ministry of Education, to help more U.S. institutions become partners with Pakistan and to um, help more students come to the United States. So we are also seeing uh, the Pakistan government coming to the United States to conferences like AIEA and NAFSA to further engage as well as the number of institutions that come to country on our various Education USA tours. So um, those are direct results of those government scholarship programs. And I'll talk a little bit about my countries, which are India, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. India, their graduate market is a little bit of a decline, and that is mostly impacted by news um, that impacts Indian students or international students in general. News regarding H1B and F1 and OPT access does impact how students in India make their decisions. They're fo very focused on return on investments, and they want to ensure that they'll be able to do, at least get access to practical work experience and raise the money that they are spending on their studies in the United States. So with the new news and um, talk about these policy changes also impacts the way that Indian students are making decisions about studying in the United States. In addition, our advisors are also working very hard in all of our countries to ensure that qualified students are applying to study in the United States, which means um, students that 
are ready and prepared to study in the United States and will intend to go to the university and actually stay in that university instead of transferring to other institutions. So for example, in Bangladesh, we're seeing an interest um, from graduate markets. There is an increased interest. Students are coming in higher numbers than before. And again, this has to do with also political reasons in the country, the way that public universities are being impacted, students are being impacted, young people are being impacted in the country. They're looking to get out. And Nepal has been a slight switch. We're seeing graduate student has usually been the uh, market for Nepal. We're seeing a shift into undergraduate, but with Nepal, the same thing. We're seeing that the agent market, the private industry market seems to be a bit unaware or misinforming, misconstruing information. So we're doing a lot with the Education USA is doing a lot with the local parties out there that students often go to, to get information, to engage on different platforms online. For example, in India and across Nepal and Bangladesh, um, there are online platforms that graduate students engage in, like, stu um, I'm sorry, I'm blanking at the moment, but we can get you that information. Um, <laughs> and their advisors are on those websites to combat misinformation, to provide accurate information. So we're doing a lot, but there is misinformation out there, or there's immediate decisions being made based on things that are happening um, in the United States. So keep that in mind when you're recruiting is how you present your state, how you present your institution, and how it supports students from the region. I think we're moving on to um, IEP trends. Great. Um, so when it comes to IEP trends, um, you'll see that um, we do have students starting on English language programs coming to the United States also for very specific English language programs. But really, um, as a whole, our region, most of our students tend to study English um, in their home countries prior to um, coming to the United States to study. Um, many of many times that's due to not having the disposable income to study in the English language programs. It's not to say that some people don't, but that's a common trend that we see compared to other regions around the world. Um, as you see, India for Ishrat students access to English language programs if they're from a curriculum that is not English focused or from tier two or three cities where access may be limited. Um, and this goes the same for um, Pakistan, um, the country that I cover. Um, what I would like to focus on a little bit, um, although Uzbekistan doesn't have many students studying English in the United States, the government is really doing a lot in country in the past year to increase English language and country. Um, so, for example, the United States and Uzbekistan recently signed a landmark assistance agreement in which we'll commit to $50 million to support, support education reform in the country. And it's predominantly on uh, primary schools as well as um, IT and funding from Washington to open new American spaces where English language will be taught. So we're seeing also movement on the ground too, um, and also opportunities for IEP programs to build partnerships and to engage. So I know there's a lot that possibly you can do, um, you know, in different blended models of reaching students who need to increase their English language. Um, but I would say, unlike some of the other scholarship, government scholarship programs, many students need to have the English language prior to entering into their programs. Um, when it comes to community colleges, um, we do have a lot of students who are interested in community colleges. Um, just because obviously it's a more economic way. Um, there's a great streamlining, um, transferring opportunities, obviously the two plus two program, um, particularly in the countries that I cover in Central Asia, um, community colleges are extremely popular. Um, a lot of our students in Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, and um, Uzbekistan know about the value of two plus two models. And particularly in Turkmenistan, we have a special program called the Top Up Scholarship Program, where if students get into a community college, we have a special program where they can get a scholarship from um, us to continue their studies in the US 
and it can be up to $10,000 a year. So that's where we've really seen an explosion when it comes to students looking at a viable way through the community college model. I will say that when I am visiting um, our centers in Central Asia, the students are very savvy and know um, a lot about this model and um, are seeking it as a viable way to higher ed in, ed in the United States. And I'll echo that as well. Students are really are knowledgeable about this pathway and what's making an impact in some of my countries like India, Bangladesh, Nepal and Sri Lanka is the presence of community colleges in the country. So for example, Fatil Dianza College, they have representatives in the country to talk to students and actively recruit. If you're not able to come and visit the countries, engage with Education USA, work with us, get ideas on how you can connect with students through webinars and uh, materials. We'll talk a little bit about that later, but also try and travel or influence your partner institution because students are being educated on articulation agreements. So they are looking for two plus two programs, programs that they can automatically transfer to for four-year institutions. So if you do have partner institutions, um, leverage, le leverage their time when they're visiting to ensure that they are also providing information or travel together when you're out there for fairs or virtual fairs um, to inform students about this opportunity, cost-saving opportunity. So it is becoming an increasing interest in, across the entire region just because the increase in costs and tuition, expenses and fluctuations of currencies in the countries, this is a very viable option. So if you can send more information about it and connect and have a presence, that'll go a long way. Now we'll talk a little bit about what they're studying and I'll pass it to Karen. All right. So um, as you can see on the left, we have what all international students are studying. And then on the right, the blue, we have students from our region. And if you can compare the two lists, you really see that a lot of the students from our SCA region are studying what students are studying around the world, what tends to be popular, engineering, business, um, health science, medicines, um, international relations is very, very popular in our region as well, in social sciences. So this is really falling usually in direct relation with the, make, like, the labor market needs of um, the countries and a lot of um, the push from the ministries and the labor market to build up obviously certain sectors, um, sometimes falling falling into gaps where the local um, country does not have the major and they're looking for their students to gain that expertise and then come back home. Um, we've definitely seen these directives come out of ministries and encouraging students, um, you know, obviously, particularly when they're with government scholarship programs. Um, I will say that a lot of our students, um, as with some of our American students, don't know the opportunities that exist um, with a, a breadth of different disciplines that we can offer in the United States, as well as the flexibility of the U.S. degree, um, doing double majors or doing a major and a minor or, you know, looking into, you know, varying different fields that you can study engineering and music at the same time. And so when you're engaging with our students, um, really, you know, keep that in the back of your head that you might have someone that really is interested in the sciences, but also might be wanting to do something in the arts too. A lot of times mom and dad are pushing um, their personal um, preferences. And so giving those students the opportunity to, um, you know, just have an array of different things to study within the US degree is um, definitely something that you'll want to highlight. I'll echo what Karen is saying throughout the region, um, especially for undergraduate students, you'll see a very diverse set of majors and interest in the arts field. You'll have students who want to study engineering, but want to do music engineering, sound engineering, and then take courses in music as well, or doing art or design in conjunction with some of the other um, more traditional STEM fields. This is a little bit of a breakdown of what they're studying for the top um, 25 the four countries that are in the top 25 origins. As for India, all of them, as you can see, it's very heavily STEM focused. Some of the unique features are in Bangladesh, there's a huge focus on business and management, um, in addition to the engineering and the sciences. 
in Bangladesh also because of the booming sports, sports industry, we're seeing a lot of requests from students coming in of studying sports management. So if that's something you offer, definitely a target for target country for in Bangladesh. Um, across the region, there are interests in different things like media uh, because of the booming uh, media market and also supply and uh, supply chain um, supply chain management with India specifically with the booming online marketing and online uh, businesses that are coming up um, are very active in the country in the region. So think about the non-traditional graphic design um, animation uh, combining with film and other aspects are extremely popular among undergraduate students as is architecture and design. So while the region is very large and students largely are focused on STEM majors, um, they do have varying levels of interest. I just don't know, as Karen mentioned, what are the opportunities available and how they can combine and have these interdisciplinary programs that are at some institutions. So if you have those, it's a great way to highlight those programs in the region. And where are they going? This is just an overview. Wanted to share all the states that they do tra traditionally travel to. Um, to study. And again, as you'll see, it's all the traditional states that all international students go to, unique being Virginia, Ohio, and Florida. Um, the focus is also being having enough um, access to research, um, having enough access to move around within uh, disciplines, um, having enough access, a lot of it also how community colleges are also allowing access to enter the system. So that's a big part of what Texas and California also stand out. Um, but if you're not enlisted in this list, um, talk to us and reach out to the Education ESA advisors on how we can talk about um, these states and what's offered at these states. Because students are looking at low cost of living, a low cost of tuition, and lots of other factors mm -hmm. when they're making the decision. As you can see, a lot of it is down south as well, but they're spread out everywhere. Um, they're looking at multiple things. So sometimes it's just a matter of brand recognition and how much of a footprint you have in the region so the students are aware of your institution and your state. And we'll talk a little bit about study abroad for US students. Great, well, if you remember when we first started off, we did see a 13% decline in um, US students coming to our region, but by far we have some wonderful locations and programs um, for our American students um, and really some great opportunities. Um, obviously there are a few countries on the list where it might be difficult for students to study in places like Afghanistan and Pakistan, although they're very wonderful and have you know um, some great programs, but we're seeing really an opening up in my region in Central Asia in more opportunities for Americans to engage. Um, an example of that would be in Kazakhstan. They have a new program called the Go Nomad program, which is in conjunction with the ministry where American students can come to Kazakhstan and study English, um, or excuse me, teach English at high school and university programs. And they'll provide placement and um, as well as, you know, a stipend for their flight to come over to Kazakhstan. And so with this opening up, um, there definitely is more potential for U.S. students. Um, and I think that we'll probably see that trend continue to grow. Um, also in the countries where we're seeing more undergraduate students coming to the United States in places like Uzbekistan and Kyrgyzstan and um, Tajikistan. Um, just want to add a note about Bhutan and Bangladesh. Bangladesh had a travel warning for several years, so that's been downgraded. So that's increased, um, that's brought up again, the interest for students to study abroad in Bangladesh. Um, in Bhutan, there are several institutions. Um, in Bhutan, the Royal Temple College being one of them, and the University of Bhutan, the Royal College. Um, they have relationships with institutions across the world, and many of them are in the United States. And these programs tend to be semester long, from three weeks to a semester long, of US students um, studying in Bhutan for various, various subjects um, that the Bhutanese institutions offer. So that's a significant increase in Bhutan. If you want to learn more about that, I can certainly provide you with detailed information. Um, and then we'll move into talking a little bit about an overview of the things we've already mentioned throughout. What are the challenges in the region to overcome? One of the main factors is currency fluctuations, especially in the rupee or any of our fluctuations in, Kazakh mm -hmm. in Kazakhstan, that's a huge issue. 
whenever that there's a devaluation, it does impact how students and families plan on studying abroad and how much they actually have at that moment, at that year, to invest in their higher education. So that does often impact how numbers um, tend to go and interest um, fluctuates with that. Um, also, moving money across from some of our countries to, a, um, to a, abroad has tends to be an issue, not so much in India or Bangladesh, Nepal, sometimes that can be an issue, and some of the other countries that can be an issue as well. The increasing cost of tuition in the U.S. and admissions-related expenses, um, with the raising cost of all the tests and uh, visas and everything else, this, the cost is just increasing, but it's not matching what the students are saving over multiple years and what families um, do for saving for their higher education for their kids. So that's also a huge challenge we're dealing with. What we're seeing now is other countries vying for students. So countries like Japan, countries like Malaysia, these are countries that are non-traditional countries that are coming in to recruit for, recruit in the region. They're offering very specific scholarships. Mm -hmm. uh, France, Germany, um, they're actively recruiting in India, offering very specific scholarships to Indian students, to Nepali students. Um, so, and Australia is there, Canada is there, they're again, they're ramping up their game and they're offering scholarships. So that's increasing and they have work opportunity. So they have all that rhetoric around what's a, what options are for H1B and OPT in the United States. The other countries are leveraging those um, in their own countries, their opportunities for work. So wherever there's opportunities for work for students, students in the region tend to um, gear towards that. Access yeah, and to I'll just chime in really quickly, Isha, on that point, because we're seeing that in Central Asia as well with the One Belt, One Road initiative. And many students, obviously, one of their first destinations, of course, is Russia. But we're also seeing, once again, the non-traditional. And students who are very, you know, smart savvy getting into um, very kind of top tier institutions in the United States, almost getting fully funded. If they don't get their full need, they're definitely going to places like Hungary and Malaysia and, of course, you know, other former uh, Soviet countries, Czech Republic. And so really that is we're really losing a lot of students um, to those countries, highly qualified Absolutely. students. Mm -hmm. And the next few things, um, which are usual for the entire global market, is access to accurate information. Students coming from outside of main cities often are misinformed and don't have access to accurate information um, or are misinformed regarding the news. They hear something in the news and they form a certain idea and that's not absolutely accurate. So we're trying a lot to combat that. Um, there's a lot of concern from parents and students about safety and acceptance in the United States. There are a lot of um, the Hindu population, the Muslim population, any population that are coming in from the South and Central Asia region, the question does come up, will I be accepted? So oftentimes, sometimes we do see students selecting the states and institutions based on what the amount, um, they might have community members there, there might be other folks from their countries there, or how the surrounding community is there in Nepalese community around the university or close to the university. Um, so for safety and numbers, so keeping that in mind, and of course I talked a little bit about return on value and return on investment, how the OPT is really a great way to showcase that, opportunities for work, what are new industries and new trends coming up from India, you might, India and Bangladesh both, you might see students coming in for their second masters because what they did in computer science may be outdated and they're trying to upgrade themselves, so they're going out and trying to find courses or an entire degree if they need to to upgrade themselves as well. So they're looking for return on value as well as return on investment. With that, I'll turn it over to Karen. Okay. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit of opportunities. We're gonna talk about um, Strong Education USA HEI tours that are very popular in our region. A few about a few things about new markets to explore, our cohort advising groups, and opportunities for our community colleges. All right, so changing social phenomena. Um, we've really seen across the region that we have, um, you know, higher acceptance and interest towards studying abroad from increasing investments in value and education. We have certain pockets where we've gone out into, you know, 
um, more, um, I don't want to say sometimes rural areas, but places where students, as Ishrat says, don't have access to Education USA. And we've really been able to make an impact on um, providing the opportunities to study in the United States, as well as explaining to them, you know, how they apply, how to use Education USA services. And because of that, really, you know, you get one or two students from region and, um, you know, getting accepted into a U.S. Uh, program or one of our, you know, summer programs, and that's really changing the landscape and opening um, more opportunities for students in other parts of um, countries that we serve. Um, we also are seeing um, changes when it comes to wood, women studying abroad and, you know, parents and communities being more acceptance of women coming to study abroad. Um, we do a lot with parents and doing certain sessions for parents so that they feel comfortable. We just talked about the challenges, you know, a minute ago. And so having parents of students who are in the United States talking about the experience of sending their son or daughter where it might not be as traditional are ways we're really trying to change, um, you know, the different types of students that we're working with and opening up um, the opportunities for more. I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that, Ishrat. No, just an example that our Education USA advisors in Bangladesh report that they're seeing a lot more females coming through for their programs um, and interest in queries than they have previously. So women are feeling empowered and parents and families are investing in their daughters as well from the region. Um, we'll move on to transforming education markets. So the student market and demographic is changing, like we talked a little bit about uh, earlier, the expanding undergraduate market in India and the Nepalese uh, graduate market is flipping to also an undergraduate market, something that wasn't there before. Their government reforms and focus on English over Russian, we talked about that in Central Asia. It's a high demographic dividend, a huge large youth population, increased competition for entry to top local institutions, um, and market of working professionals. Um, in India, if you're not marketing, if you're only going to institutions, you're missing out um, in the, all the working professionals already in the IT industry. And they're already working at Facebook, they're working at Google, at Microsoft in India. And that's a huge market. That's a market that Education USA is, um, in, is contacting and trying to make some headway with. So they have access to accurate information and huge potential for expansion in tier two and tier three cities. If you travel to India, um, or Bangladesh and only focus on the major cities, uh, you might be missing out on very good students that are in Chittagong in Bangladesh or in different tier two cities like in Pune or in Chandigarh or Vadoda. So these are all cities that you might, or Hubli, which are Mysore, you know, these are cities that you might not have in your list, but these need to be on your list. And we break it down for you in India later on in this presentation, I'll share um, a list of webinars that we've done with India breaking down into seven, five different, seven different presentations across different regions to help you understand what the markets look like. So keep in mind that it's a constantly evolving market. Things are changing on the ground. India is investing heavily into developing study abroad. So they're inviting international students to come to India and in turn, they're building education infrastructure. Bangladesh is uh, set to announce working with foreign institutions and partnerships. So there are lots of things happening in the region that impact the way that students want to um, access study in the United States with a lot more competition and a lot more awareness. One thing I wanted to point out that I didn't mention before is also the agents that you work with. Make sure that they're well-trained and mm -hmm. upgraded, regularly mm -hmm. informed, because we found that many times agents uh, themselves are not always fully aware or sometimes tend to misinform students and we have to do a lot of uneducating un and re-educating to the students. Um, so if you are working with agents, do ensure that they you are cultivating, you're culling that list regularly, you're making site visits to them whenever you do travel and you are investing into educating them and building awareness and have them come to Education USA sessions. Our sessions are all free and ac accessible to the public. They can ask questions, they can ask um, for information, they can send in students for workshops that we have that they maybe are not so strong in in their process. So we're there to help support you and also support with all the work, all the other um, all partners that you might have on the ground. Karen, I'll pass it to you to talk about um, access to information. Hey. 
All right, so access to information and correct information, as Sajrat mentioned, is key. And so we've seen um, that we've been able to reach a broader market, and a lot of that is due to improved internet connectivity um, and social media, um, especially in some of my smaller countries like Turkmenistan and Tajikistan, as there's improvement on the ground with internet con connectivity, we're seeing more students online and being able to um, reach them through various social media platforms. Um, you can also reach out to um, the REACTs, the advisors, as to what platform our students are on. It can vary from Facebook to WeChat to um, Instagram and Twitter, um, but we definitely see um, that is a great way to reach our students. Um, we're seeing an increased exposure um, as to studying abroad, which I think we um, definitely mentioned and addressed already. Um, we're seeing a growing network of guidance counselors. And so um, Education USA is really working with high school, mostly guidance counselors, on helping them get the information that they need in order to do their job better. Um, it really is a multiplier factor. Um, as we engage with these high school counselors and we connect you when you're on the ground or virtually, we can really help um, have you know, a much broader footprint in trying to get students um, to learn more about the opportunities to study in the United States. So for example, in Pakistan, we're going to be doing a high school counselor um, training in March. Um, we're just doing it really all across the board. We have a lot of high school counselors in Kazakhstan. We have a new group of 65 counselors that we're working with across the country. So these are just examples. I know it's happening in Ishret's region as well, that we can also help you connect to those high school guidance counselors. And you can help us too um, with their professional development as well. As you know, many times these individuals wear a variety of different hats. They're often teaching classes um, and you know they're not just helping students apply to the US but to a number of different schools, which can be quite daunting. And then lastly, um, we have more Education USA activities and events, including collaboration with our US embassies and consulates. Um, of course, we do this all the time, but as we continue to have programs, new programs come on board, as we open up new American corners around our countries, our advisors continue to engage and work very closely and collaboratively with the U.S. mission in our countries. Um, and saying social media, they're very, very active in the region. They have internet, they have internet on their phones, they have phones, everybody has a phone, they do business on their mm -hmm. phones. And the increasing number of US institutions that have a physical presence within India that acts, that supports international students across the region has having a huge impact. When students ask a question, they can receive an immediate response um, online, Facebook, social media, WhatsApp, whatever it may be and Australians and Canadians are very, very good at it. So if you're not responding to student queries within a short amount of time, you are going to lose them. Yeah. Some other factors, um, I'll let Karen address this. Um, just a reminder to promote the hashtag, you are welcome here. We all know about that came that came out of Temple University a few years ago, uh, as well as the various scholarship programs that are um, um, an option for students. If your institution has a hashtag, you are welcome here scholarship program, definitely um, push that in our region. Um, we have our local government scholarships to study abroad. Um, I mentioned a few in my region, Kazakhstan, Pakistan. We have a new government scholarship program in Uzbekistan, as well as a few spots in Turkmenistan. So reach out to us on the specifics of those government scholarship programs. If they're on list, what majors they're looking for. Um, many times we do webinars, we'll talk about those at the end where we really go into the weeds about those specific programs and how um, you can attract students to your institution. And if your institution is the right fit too, I think it's important to be mindful of that. Um, and then Education USA has a number of different um, activities going on. Um, I don't necessarily think we have time, I think, to go through all of these. I want to be mindful. We have a few more slides to get through, but we have our cohort advising groups. Um, in some of my countries, we have College Camp USA, where in the summertime, we work with undergraduate students. 
Uh, we have internship programs in Pakistan. We have a GRE prep program where we're going out um, into various parts of Pakistan and helping students prep for the GRE, giving them vouchers, and then talking about our five steps to US study in the United States. Um, so these are just a few examples. Thank you. Um, now we're going to talk about how you can position yourself. And again, we'll, you're probably already doing a lot of this. We're just going to talk about things that really work. And we'll quickly go through the slides as well. So taking advantage of a very fast growing market. So some of the proven methods, which does give results, is you cannot be face-to-face -face interaction and personal relationship building. There's nothing above that. Once you've made a friend in, with a student or with a parent, that will have a multiplier effect as well. Um, and that will ensure that you have that lasting relationship builds trust, and that will also um, give you end-to-end -end results. Um, so there's nothing that we can say above face-to-face -face interactions. We have lots of cohorts we build in the build in each center. So working with those cohorts really help because they're working and they're dedicated, they're working through the process, so they're mentally prepared. These are students that are being handheld through the entire process. Social media websites, we'll go through a few of those. Webinars and virtual fairs, videos, how to engage with alumni that's impactful, and of course, faculty members. I'll let Karen talk about what do applicants value the most. So, and I think this speaks worldwide. Of course, our applicants value trust in that personal connection. As Isha said, you know, whether it's your social media or an email, when a student reaches out to you, making sure that you get back to them in a reasonable amount of time in building that relationship with the student, especially if you have the opportunity to come to our countries and to meet with those students, um, that really is key. Um, you know, they're going on the other side of the world, their parents are sending them, a lot of times it's a huge financial commitment, so building that trust from the beginning is so important. Um, of course, branding. Um, it takes a while to build your brand in our countries, but um, as you know, if you come back, you know, for a number of years, there are a lot of students that recognize your institution. They know who you are. I always love when I go to a new country for the first time and I'm doing a site visit report and all of the students know about a community college in Wyoming that I've never necessarily heard of before. And they're like, of course we know about this institution. And so that branding goes a long way. Um, Financial aid and opportunity, financial aid opportunities. A lot of our students are looking for some type of financial aid. So if you do have a scholarship program, um, definite, or excuse me, if you do have a financial aid option in your institution, make sure that you make that known from the get-go. Um, it's also sometimes a good idea to translate the financial aid opportunities in the native language, not necessarily for the student, but for the parents. And then, of course, I think, as I mentioned in the beginning, that prompt and personalized response, showing them that you really want those students on your campus and building that trust from the get-go. We'll talk a little bit about the different ways that you can have face-to-face -face, um, interaction. So you can be, you can present at Education ESA centers, you can conduct workshops. We do various types of workshops on how to write recommend how to write your statement of purposes to helping guidance counselors write their um, recommendation letters. Um, we help you set up what are the best school, what are some good schools to contact for, you know, whether it's high schools or universities. You can visit our American spaces, which are part of the American embassies. Our fairs, their new stops in Central Asia. We have lots of regional conferences. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the end. And we also have a mobility fact sheet that displays exactly the best and worst times to visit. If you plan to come to our country, check in with our education as an advising center mm -hmm. so you know that the time you're coming is going to work. India itself has so many holidays and the West may be shut down for a holiday while the South is completely open and nothing's changed. So we can help you build that itinerary if you let us know around what time of the year you're planning to come. Exam schedules, if you want to talk to students, you definitely mm -hmm. don't want to come around exam times. And different curriculums, whether it's um, IB curriculum or the CBSC curriculum or any other curriculum, they're all exams at different times of the year. So it's a lot of calendars our advisors are aware of and have been talking about. So please do check in with us before you travel. Mm -hmm. um, videos, um, tailor made videos for specific audiences go a long way. Use your parents, the parents of your students, incoming students, outgoing students 
uh, freshmen transfer, just tailor it to the right audience. That's the most important thing. If it's a general video, it'll get overlooked. If it's a very specific targeted video, it'll get viewed over and over and over again. That's just from experience of what we've seen that works. Use your current students, use alumni, and you know, give pictures of when you are in the country interacting with students. That also has a lot of messaging that goes behind it, that you are present, you know them, you understand the countries, you understand what their needs are. That's a strong message that you can send out. So if you're creating videos, and also ensure that they're not very long. If it's under a yeah. minute, it is the maximum that they will watch. These are short attention spans. They're watching so many videos online. A minute is about what you can do. And that first 10 seconds has to be really engaging and know exactly what they're going to be um, watching in the next few seconds. Right, and I'll just add that Education USA is also helping you build your brand with videos. An example would be our office in Pakistan. You know, before you come on our tours, we're usually doing re requesting if you have a video so that we introduce you to the students before you actually get on the ground. So um, know that there's ways that we can also help push you through our own social media too. Alumni engagement has a huge impact in the region. Mm -hmm. All of our centers across South Asia and many in Central Asia conduct regular alumni fairs. For example, Delhi is getting just geared up to host their alumni fair in January. Kolkata has it in the summertime. Um, Bangladesh is getting ready to host one in the summer as well. So there are many countries that host alumni fairs, and these are completely free to participate. We often send out notices on the um, newsletter that comes from Education USA every month, um, requesting whether you have alumni that you would like to participate. We only ensure that the institutions um, approve of the alumni that will represent them. So they can be current, we call it alumni fairs, but really it can be a current student that's visiting home. Um, it can be anyone that you think you feel comfortable representing your institution, as long as it's not an agent that's going to be talking about their services at the event, that they're only going to be representing your institution. <clears throat> alumni can also make videos for us when we'll post them on our Education USA pages, and that has a lot of traction. We also have meet an alumni special session. So even if they're not attending a fair, you know somebody from the school or has graduated or currently a student is planning to visit any country, reach out to Education USA. Maybe they can talk about your institution with an audience. And Karen will talk, you, talk to you about some impactful ways that you can use faculty members. Yeah, um, a lot of times faculty members will sometimes um, go to specific countries and help recruit because they might be originally from that country or they speak the language. We've seen that quite frequently at times. Or we'll see faculty members who might be on a Fulbright, they might be a visiting scholar, or possibly just coming through the country. Please reach out to Education USA and have that faculty member come into our center, meet with our Education USA advisors, but even better yet, meet with our students. Um, sometimes we'll do sessions like we just had an advice, we just had a faculty member coming through um, who was a law professor to Kazakh or to Pakistan. And so we're like, we can do a session. What is it like to study law in the United States? What is a typical classroom experience like? Um, there's nothing better than having our students meet with a faculty member and having them engage. And also there might even be possibilities for um, collaboration with ministries or certain departments. So our Education USA advisors are really well connected. And so connecting them with your faculty and using that as a way to meet students um, is a great stepping stone. Um, we have a lot of social media and website printed material. We've mentioned about our various different social media platforms, um, email correspondence, how important that is still in some of our countries. Um, a lot of our um, countries are using WhatsApp, making sure that your brochures are international student friendly, um, knowing what to translate can be key. Sometimes it's not good to translate everything in the local language. So reaching out to you know, the REACTs and the advisors to say what would make sense, um, making sure you're spending your money wisely if you are getting something professionally translated. And um, at times, maybe writing articles in the local newspaper. I know in Uzbekistan, we were trying to get some of our reps to um, write an article about higher education in the United States. 
what better than to position yourself um, in a newsletter or professional journal. Um, so these are just some out of the box options as well. And I'll just emphasize in printed materials, we've seen one pagers that list everything that the student needs to know in a very clear fashion has a lot more traction than an entire book where the student has to find that information. So if you can create one pagers that lists our lead majors and all the breakdown of what the costs might be and what opportunities, what options there are for scholarships or breaking down their, um, their tuition, um, or reducing their tuition costs. If you can put that all information, doesn't matter if it's small print, we've seen students and parents really read that one pager over trying to look at an, a three-page brochure and trying to read through all of it to find information. It's a lot more cost. It's more cost effective and advisors can easily print them out, keep them at the centers, bring them to different places, easier to carry, and students can just put it into their folders and have it accessible. So one pagers that explain all the key things that an international student needs to know about, with including information about tuition and all the cost breakdowns will go a long way. Definitely. And what you post really does matter. That's your brand, that's, your, that's how they know who you are, that's what's going to have an impact. So if you're posting something, you can tag Education USA, you can tag the Education USA Center in that country. All of our centers in, in our region have a country page on Facebook, so you can find us very easily. Um, it has to be very clear information and exact information, and they have to understand what they're getting from that message. So if it's too long, they're not going to read it. If it's short, make sure they're only reading the first three lines. Make sure the important information is in those first three lines. And the graphic to be engaging and clean. Um, oftentimes we see lots of graphics that come through our social media requests and the graphics are just too much or it's a face, but the information isn't clear. So as long as the graphic and the image is clear, we see that that picks up traction and they're easily shareable on different social media platforms. Um, mm -hmm. Karen, do you want to address a little bit about the interactive and the sure. online presence? Yeah. So we have webinars, interactives, and online presentations. Some of these are held directly with our Central Education USA network. So like our College Week Live series that happens, I believe, five times a year, the largest one during International Education Week, where we'll have 12 hours where you can sign up. You can meet students from around the world. You can give presentations. Um, that's a really great way to virtually interact. Um, we have interactives as well on certain topics. Um, where we'll have something being hosted at the State Department, and then we'll have our Education USA centers connect. Um, and then all of us have various specific um, online webinar interactives that we do as REACTs around the world, not just with, with our region, with ISHRAT and I. So the best thing to do really is to find out about these through the Education USA. Um, HEI monthly newsletter, as well as the Education USA social media sites. Um, so just know that there are also a lot of other ways to continue to engage with us online um, and that you necessarily don't have to be on foot, although we would love to see you face to face. Absolutely. And if you have students you're working with already and they need a little bit more support, um, Education USA India, for example, has a YouTube channel and breaks everything down in five steps in little pieces. There's a specific a webinar that's 30 minutes long on OPT and CPTs. There's specific sessions on how to do CSS profiles. So there are lots of different topics that our advisors have put together over time, and they've created these videos and made accessible for free for students. So if you're working with students, that's a great resource to connect them to as well. Um, we'll talk a little bit about institutional partnerships, and Karen has a wealth of information to share. Yeah. Um, so a lot of our countries are looking for institutional partnerships, as I mentioned, particularly in a lot of my Central Asia countries. Um, and I know that many times if you are the one that's on the road who is doing the recruitment, this doesn't necessarily fall under your portfolio. But please, please, when you're coming, even if it's not you, um, find out who the person is on your campus who can make these connections and be that go-to person because a lot of these countries are growing, they're expanding. I mentioned in the beginning about Uzbekistan and all the opportunities for English language programs, faculty exchanges, two plus two programs, 
Um, a lot of times they want to set up certain departments that are looking for, you know, really um, specific fields of study. Um, with American Councils, it was just announced that actually the deadline was on December um, 9th, but it was for um, six community colleges to get a grant to engage in a partnership um, in um, Kazakhstan and Central Asia. So these are things that we're posting all the time. If you're connected to ISHRAT or myself or other REACTs online, we're heavily pushing these different programs. And so there are a lot of opportunities, but I would say these things don't happen necessarily organically. Sometimes they do, but a lot of times you have to actually spend time in the ground. So if you're recruiting, if you're on the ground, really, really think about how you can connect your institution, even if it's not you. Um, we mentioned our college prep club um, programs. Uh, predominantly, this is at the undergraduate level, although we do have some graduate cohort programs. This is just the list of the advising cohort groups that we have in country. We're hoping to add Afghanistan in the near future. Just gave an example of Kyrgyzstan. In Kyrgyzstan alone, um, the numbers are actually higher than what's listed on the page. We have close to 80 students in our Prep for Success program study with us, as well as our Education USA cohort program. So these are students who are spending a lot of time with our advisors, who are committed, um, who have you know a lot of criteria to be in our cohort program. So make sure that you're engaged with these students. These are the ones that you really know are spending a lot of time and effort and who could possibly be a good fit for your campus. And sometimes you might come across students that are a bit too young or um, just not quite ready yet to apply to um, your institution or any other institution in the US. Feel free to send them to Education USA. They can participate in any of our preparation, preparatory clubs or any of our cohort programs to begin their process. These are long-term programs, some are short-term, some are long-term. They can definitely get that level of support to help them prepare. Um, an exciting announcement from India, and again, students across South Asia can access this tool. We just created an app for Education USA. Um, if you want to know more about it, you can go ahead and find the Education USA India app on your um, iPhone or your openware. It's available across all platforms. It's an answer bot that answers questions. Only the login section will only be accessible to Indian students, but regular information, just general information about how to apply in the United States, um, news pieces, that's all accessible to everybody else. We just pushed this out. We're still developing it. It's a soft launch we've done. Um, the advisors are continuing to develop it. All the Education USA advisors in India work together to build an extensive uh, frequently asked questions so that students can have an answer bot go through a lot of details and what are things that they need to do to prepare to study in the United States to prepare their application process and there will come a point where their app will say time to meet an advisor and assign an advising center according to where they're located. Um, so there are lots of exciting features and more coming through with the app so we're excited to share this news with you. Um, you can share it with your incoming students from South Asia or from India. And with that, we'll talk about engagement opportunities, all the events that happen throughout the year that you can take note of and reach out to us to mm -hmm. learn more about. First up, we do virtual recruitment in South Asia. India hosts two virtual fairs every year. Uh, they just started undergrad, fair, undergrad virtual fair, which will be coming up soon. Um, we couldn't do it in October in 2019, so we're going to reschedule it for early this early in 2020. Graduate Virtual Fair, we've been doing it for three years running and it's been an amazing program. We have so many institutions that sign on that it is a cost um, associated to US institutions, but it's very, very little. Um, to students, it's free and students from all over the world that are of Indian origin or South Asian tend to learn about this through our partner, partner Yakit, um, and they join us. And we've had over three to 4,000 students come through a two-day virtual fair. And the interesting thing about it is that students come back, it's a two-day fair, but students come back over and over. This year, we saw more students coming back um, over and over over the two-day period to talk to more and more institutions, to learn more, to get more information. Um, so it's an exciting thing. The virtual fair is set up just like a real in-person fair. You get your own room, you get your own booth, you get a chat function, you can put in resources, you can put up brochures and videos, everything that you would do in a real fair, you can have access to and you can connect with the students and get their details afterwards. We have the Central Asia tour, 
and Karen can share more about that. Um, yes, so um, historically we've had the Central Asia tour stop off in Kazakhstan. Last year we added Kyrgyzstan as a stop and um, this year we also added Uzbekistan with the hope of Turkmenistan. Um, it has been such a successful fair. Um, we had between 14 to 16 HEIs on the tour um, traveling with us. Um, to the left is just a sample of what the Central Asia tour looked like in conjunction with Eurasia. Um, we usually do this only in the fall. We don't necessarily do a Central Asia tour in the spring, although we do do one for Pakistan that I'll talk about in just a minute. So if you'd like to um, come to Central Asia, we would love to have you. We have some phenomenal students and um, this is a little bit more about recruitment in South Asia. Um, upcoming in the spring will be Nepal and Pakistan. Um, is to the left um, with the dates um, as well as the cost. Um, Nepal is, I think, uh, $1,250. Uh, $1, Pakistan is $1,000. We have multiple city stops. Um, and if you would like to have more information, particularly about these tours, um, we can give you those details. Um, we also, um, I do a number of country spotlights um, in Central Asia. Um, the next one coming up is January 15th. Online talking about opportunities to engage with our Afghani students. Um, as with this webinar, all of our webinars are recorded. Um, we've countries within my portfolio in the last year um, so I'd be more than willing to send you those links to those recordings and we hope to see you online in January if you'd like to have more information about working um, with our various advisors and centers across uh, Afghanistan. I'll talk a little bit more about the series that we just completed. All throughout 2019 we prepared recruitment webinars uh, from South Asia so the entire series of seven Actually, it's nine videos, I believe, um, but India is broken down into seven separate videos. And as you can see in the picture, it's Western India, South India, Eastern India. We've broken them down so that you can see India in small pieces, because what might work for you in recruiting students in North India, the type of students you might find in Northern India is slightly different from the type of students you might find in Western India or even Southern India. So we've kind of broken that down for you to give you an overview of what the region looks like education systems, what's predominant in those areas um, to help you understand. Uh, to receive the videos, the, vi the link is there on the slide. If you write to me, I can happily provide you with the link and you can also find it on the Education USA website under the React page. Um, if you need more information, happy to provide that to you and I hope this is helpful. This was all throughout 2019, so the information is um, up to date as of this year. And with that, I will pass it on to our colleague, Caroline. Hello. All right. Well, thank you, Karen and Ishrat, for such a thorough and insightful snapshot into this region and analysis of the newest um, open doors numbers and what that looks like in South and Central Asia. I always learn so much from um, hearing you all speak, so thank you. Uh, so before I get into the next couple slides, we're almost to the end of the presentation. I thought that we would just jump into questions. I know we're a little bit past an hour and I wanna be mindful of everyone's time and address the questions in case um, people have to sign off soon. So I am going to reference questions that came in. Um, Related to engagement um, in South and Central Asia, there was a question that just came in. What are the dates for the 2020 undergrad virtual fair? Have those been released yet? Um, any that, comments on that? No, that has not been released. If you shoot me an email, I connect you with our India advisor to put you on the list. So as soon as the dates are released, you'll get that information. So my email okay. address will is ijahan at educationusa.org. Yes, the last slide will have all our contact information. Thank you. Um, the next question, this is directed to both you, uh, Ishrat and Karen. 
Gabrielle from Indiana University asked, considering what majors students are studying, where does law fall as a popular field of study? So either one of you can start off with that question. I'll take it first. Um, law is a hard one for South Asia because they are still a parliamentary system and the US law system is very, very different. Um, we don't see a lot of traction. However, there is interest when it's uh, taxation law because of the number of US companies and other entities that are based in India. So we see taxation law, we're seeing an increased interest in entertainment law and sports, uh, anything to do with sports and entertainment is coming up just because of the huge um, entertainment and sports industry in the, in the region it's, and the reach all over the world. Maritime law is very big. So these are the few things that I'm aware of, but law isn't exactly something that's strong that Education USA advisors can give you a lot of help with, but we can definitely point you in the right direction of the law schools and law, major law firms that you can connect with to get more information. But having said that, it's not a huge mobility that we see um, from South Asia, just because um, they're not able to practice it back home. So unless it's an existing lawyer that's looking to expand their services, and can learn like international law, anything related to international law or something that's impactful internationally, um, a field or a subject, um, those are the types of interests that we see. Thank you, Ishrat. Karen, anything to add? Yeah, it's pretty much the same for um, countries that I cover as well. There might, might have students in Pakistan that might be interested in law, but it's just, it's not common, especially because we're really talking about a lot of my other countries are quite small. It's not popular in Afghanistan, um, but we can do the same. We can put you in touch um, with different faculties on the ground and definitely our advisors could probably give a little bit more in-depth knowledge as to what's happening. Great, thank you to you both. Um, the next question is for Ishrat. Um, Tolga asked, what can you say about the recent developments in Bangladesh um, about letting foreign universities open campuses? Um, this is Bangladesh. my um, so we were very excited to hear that that is a possibility. In my personal experience, I think it'll be a little bit more time before it becomes a reality, but it is since the conversation has started, it would be a good time to start doing a Reiki, start looking at what options are available in the country so that you can be the first foot on the ground, one of the first feet on the ground, rather than being in the stampede later on. Because that's also moving, not only for US institution and opportunity, the folks that will jump at this are the Australians, the Japanese, the Chinese, that are already primed and ready to enter um, relationships with all these countries in South Asia. So if, they, if you're thinking about it, come down to Bangladesh, talk to a few people, you can reach out to the embassy, you can reach out to the Education USA advisors that can point you in the right direction and the right people that you can talk to um, to get more information. Thank you. That's all for questions that have come in. Um, I will go into the last part of the presentation, just a few slides. And if you all think of anything else, please feel free to type your questions into the chat box and we'll address them at the very end. Um, but I just wanted to take the um, last part of the presentation to highlight a few resources and ways in which you all can engage with our global Education USA network. Because we've really been focused on SBA, but we offer a lot of resources globally. So let me. The slides go in here. Okay, so I always say that the best way to get an overview of all our, our resources is to start with our website. It's a great starting point. So visit educationusa.state.gov if you have not already. We have an entire section dedicated to US higher ed professionals such as yourselves. You can request a login if you haven't already. Um, and subscribe to our monthly um, higher education newsletter, which includes a lot of great resources like upcoming events going on in the regions, webinars, articles on student mobility trends, advisor spotlights, so you can get to know some of our Education USA advisors in the field a bit better. So that's um, a great resource. Also, through our website, you can submit financial aid opportunities that your institution might be offering. Um, that's a great way to get the word out about your institution to prospective students and showcase 
you know, publicly um, on our website, um, any scholarships or financial aid packages that you're offering to international students. Um, and also, if you haven't noticed, our REACTs, um, Karen and Ishrat, are such wonderful resources, and worldwide our, our REACTs are wonderful. And so by requesting a login, you have access to um, the REACT contact information. So you can get in touch with them, and they are such a wonderful resource to take advantage of. Um, another thing on our website, there are so many great free online resources. Um, just to point out one is our global guide. So this is one of EDUSA's signature resources to guide colleges and universities in their approach to international student recruitment. Um, it highlights, you know, country recruitment trends, challenges, different scholarship opportunities, and it's written by the DC Education USA staff and our REACT. So check that out if you haven't already. The 2019 edition is available on our website. No login needed. This is just you know, publicly available on the website. Um, not pictured here, but another great resource on our website are our student mobility facts and figures sheets. So each year, Education USA produces succinct country fact sheets. They summarize um, key student mobility facts and figures based on the new uh, data from Open Doors. Uh, the sheets also provide an overview of the national education system, secondary education and university system in um, various countries, and they just really spotlight uh, essential must-know information for U.S. higher education institutions um, recruiting international students um, in the various countries. So great, great resource. And a lot more. I just don't have enough time to mention them right now. Another thing that you should definitely check out is the Find an Advising Center tool on our website. Um, this, you can search by region, location, level of service, but it just is a way to get a better feel for um, what Education Lo USA looks like, our presence in various countries that you're interested in learning more about or um, possibly scheduling recruitment trips out there. So um, start with this tool and I guarantee it'll help um, guide you. Okay, and uh, one more thing to mention, uh, how you can engage with Education USA. So we um, definitely push our Education USA advisors to participate in pro professional development opportunities. So that entails coming to the United States for various conferences um, and trainings and worldwide participating as well. But um, a lot of the conferences and trainings that they attend are here in the US. So while they're attending these events, we also schedule um, campus visits for them just so they get a chance to um, be on US campuses and learn firsthand, you know, what's, um, what it's like uh, to be a college student in the US. Um, and this is a great chance for you to meet some of the Education USA advisors, learn more about their countries, international students coming from their countries who they're advising. Um, so we uh, put out the call for campus hosts um, for 2020 on our website recently. So you can check that out at educationusa.state.gov. And if you're interested in hosting um, our advisors while they're in the US for these conferences and trainings, it's a wonderful opportunity. So definitely look into that. Sorry, I'm breezing through these. Uh, last but not least, um, you know, Ishad and Karen touched on a lot of wonderful um, SCA specific events, but there are other upcoming events um, going on in other areas of the world. And just a few to highlight, we have our Education USA Western Hemisphere Regional Forum that's coming up in spring 2020. So this brings together um, all the advisors and reacts from a certain region and U.S. higher ed institutions are invited to share best practices. Um, U.S. higher ed professionals are invited to present specialized training sessions and to network with our advisors and REACTs um, within this specific region at this event. So it's a great opportunity. And you can also see in fall 2020, we have a regional forum for Europe and Eurasia. So look into that. 
And then the last event to plug is the annual Education USA Forum in Washington, D.C. So this gives higher ed professionals the opportunity to engage with Education USA advisors from around the world. We usually invite about up to 50 advisors to attend all 14 of our regional education advising coordinators or REACs um, are in attendance, as well as US Department of State staff and staff from IAE or cooperating agency. And there's tons of sessions on um, the latest regional and country specific trends and tips for strategic international recruitment planning. So it really is a wonderful event. And if you haven't already looked into it, um, check it out on our website. All our Education USA events worldwide are advertised on our website. So that is a central place to go to check out what's happening in the network. Okay. That concludes all of our slides. Um, I'm just going to do one last check to see if we had any questions come in while I was speaking. Okay. Let me check it out. No questions. Okay. All right. Well, you all did such a wonderful job that all your all their questions were answered through the wonderful information that you presented. Um, we are now reaching almost an hour and a half, so we're going to wrap things up. I just want to thank Ishad and Karen, our, our REACs, for joining us today and sharing your expertise. Um, and thank you to all our U.S. higher ed um, folks that joined us as well. We appreciate all you do to keep the U.S. number one study destination for international students. And we appreciate all you do in creating, you know, welcoming and engaging uh, campus environments for international students, both inside and outside the classroom to make sure they're successful when they're here in the U.S. studying. Um, just a note that this presentation is being recorded and will be made available through a link that's posted to our website. So if there was something you wanted to review or you want to share it with colleagues, please feel free to reference that on our website. Um, and on this last slide, you can see all our contact information. So um, Karen Ishrat are wonderful resources and I encourage you to reach out to them um, for all your recruitment, um, recruitment needs and questions. So thank you all. That, that's, um, that's a wrap on the SBA webinar, and um, we hope that you found it useful and helpful. Take care. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.